there. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Withdrawal, a weekly discussion on antidepressants and the issues surrounding them. Hello, this is James. Welcome to episode 17 of Let's Talk Withdrawal, a weekly podcast discussing antidepressants and mental health. This week, I'm honoured to have been able to talk with Dr. Joanna Moncrief. Dr. Moncrief is a psychiatrist, academic and author. She has an interest in the history, philosophy and politics of psychiatry, and particularly in the misuse and misrepresentation of psychiatric drugs. As an author, Dr. Moncrief has written extensively on psychiatric drugs, and her books include The Myth of the Chemical Cure in 2008, A Straight-Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Drugs, published in 2009, and The Bitterest Pills, The Troubling Story of Antipsychotic Drugs in 2013. She is one of the founding members and the co-chairperson of the Critical Psychiatry Network. The Critical Psychiatry Network consists of psychiatrists from around the world who are sceptical of the idea that mental disorders are simply brain diseases and of the dominance of the pharmaceutical industry. I was keen to talk to Dr Moncrief about her work to address the realities of psychiatric drugs and the groundbreaking RADAR study which focuses on antipsychotic drugs. Dr. Moncrief, thank you so much for talking with me today. Could I firstly ask you to tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be working in the psychiatric field? Yes, so I trained as a doctor um, back in the 1980s, but I was always interested in philosophical questions, I suppose, about uh, you know what it is to be a human being, um, what, what's the, the right way to live. Uh, what is knowledge, all those sorts of things. Um, so so psychiatry appealed to me because it uh, encompasses some of those philosophical issues. And then when I was working as a junior psychiatrist, I got interested in drug treatment, really because it was clear that it was, um, you know, such a dominant method of treatment. There was almost no one who came in front of a psychiatrist even back then who wasn't on at least one sort of medication and usually several. So that's what sparked my interest in drug treatment in particular. Thank you. And can I ask you a little about the Critical Psychiatry Network, which I think you're one of the founders of? I wondered if one of the motivators to found it was that experience of seeing how powerful a force drug treatment was in psychiatry. My my concerns about the overuse of drug treatment were, were definitely one of the um, stimuli for founding the Critical Psychiatry Network. And, and more than that, it was the realisation that the way I saw the effects of the drugs was different from the way they were being presented in the textbooks and the way that that many of my superiors saw them. So they just thought, you know, drugs were a great thing. They were making people better, making people normal again. And that's not what I saw. I saw, you know, whole, this was back in the era of the old asylums. I saw whole wards full of people sort of shuffling around, clearly very heavily drugged, what we might call zombified. And and other doctors didn't see that. So so it was my realisation that people saw different things um, in the mental health arena, um, that, that they saw it in different ways and had completely different understandings about what men- mental disorders represent and how to go about helping people with them. Um, that, that sparked my motivation to set up the Critical Psychiatry Network because I realised there were other psychiatrists around who had the same sorts of concerns and I wanted to get us together um, both to support each other, but also to try and be more effective within the field. It must be a very difficult place to occupy because I'm aware of yourself and a few others, but there aren't that many in the psychiatric field who will challenge their own profession and ask, are we doing the right thing by medicating so quickly and medicating so many? I just wondered what your experience was of occupying that contrary position. I think it it is difficult. And I think it's got more difficult, really, over the last few decades as psychiatry has become more and more preoccupied with biological interventions and investigations and theories. I think if you go back a few decades, psychiatry was more mixed and there was more emphasis on the social, more emphasis on um, psychotherapy and, and a, more of a place for criticism and critics. It's curious, isn't it? Because fairly recently, we've come to regard the chemical imbalance theory of mental illness as a myth. So really, psychiatry should be more open to challenge, but it actually seems to be becoming more entrenched in its views. Yes, I mean, there has been, I think, recently, uh, a bit of a reversal, certainly in in the popular uh, world, you know, out there outside psychiatry, I think people have started to 
um, become concerned about the huge levels of prescribing, about the side effects of these medications. And yeah, I, I think there's more awareness that they're not just um, an unmitigated you know, benefit, that, that there are lots of downsides to the use of these drugs. But the majority of, of the psychiatric field probably isn't um, at the same place, hasn't quite developed that awareness yet. Thank you, Dr Moncrief. I'd like to go into a little more detail about psychiatric drugs, if that's OK. You've written extensively on psychiatric drugs, their mechanisms of action and their role in mental health treatment, particularly in the book The Bitterest Pills, released in 2013. You formulated the drug-centred model to better explain how drugs affect the body. Could you help me understand the difference between a traditional disease-centred model and a drug-centred model of action? Yes, of course. So I think this is the most important point that I've been trying to get over in the last 10 years or so of my career. And it started from realising that the way that drugs were being presented as working for mental health problems was really just not supported by evidence and not justified. And that traditional way of understanding how drugs work is the idea that they are somehow targeting and helping to reverse an underlying brain problem. So, for example, you know, the idea that antidepressants correct a serotonin imbalance illustrates that way of thinking. The idea is that depression is caused by an imbalance of brain chemicals like serotonin and that the and the antidepressants are effective because they help to correct that imbalance. They help to restore your serotonin levels. It sounds very enticing. It's nice and simple and you can draw pictures to show serotonin receptors. Um, and, you know, make it visually appealing. But there's just no evidence that depression is caused by a serotonin imbalance or that antidepressants work because they affect, because they raise levels of serotonin. That there's, you know, no support for that idea at all. And what I realised we were missing when we were thinking um, like that about antidepressants and other drugs is the fact that these drugs are themselves mind-altering substances. So if you give these drugs to normal people, they will make people feel different and sometimes behave differently. Now, different psychiatric drugs have different effects on on the the brain and, and therefore the mind. And some drugs like SSRI antidepressants, you know, the, the common ones like Prozac and um, Siroxat, these drugs have probably relatively subtle effects on people. But then there are other drugs like the drugs we now refer to as antipsychotics, so that would include things like um, Seroquel and Zyprexa, that have really noticeable and obvious effects. And, you know, immediately people know that they're taking an active substance and it makes them feel a bit groggy and a bit drowsy. So what I realised is that all the research on drug treatments that's been done over the last few decades has totally ignored the fact that these drugs alter the way that normal people feel and behave. And obviously that's that's really relevant if you're giving a drug to someone who who has a mental health difficulty of one sort or another. Um, and it, it's relevant because those effects of the drug might interact with the mental health problems. And it's also relevant because it means that placebo control trials, which are the trials that are set up to establish whether the drugs are helpful or not, are invalidated by these effects. They cannot establish whether a drug is correcting an underlying brain disease because they can't cancel out the mind-altering effects that the drugs have. Thank you. And Also, it seems that in many fields of medicine, we have drugs that are well targeted because we understand the underlying disease mechanism well. But with mental health issues, we really don't have that good an understanding of the basis of these conditions, do we? Absolutely. And I think this is such an important point to get across, that psychiatric drugs are not sophisticated, targeted medications, interventions. They're just not. We do not have the evidence to claim that that's what they're doing. And that's relatively crude instruments that, you know, make people feel different. And, And we don't even understand quite how they make people feel different. Certainly over the long term, we don't have good information about the sorts of effects they can produce. Well, that's certainly true in my own experience, because when my antidepressant was prescribed five years ago, it was sold as a very specific drug to fix a very specific abnormality in my brain and it was likened to a diabetic needing insulin and yet over the last year or so I've come to realize that there's no evidence to support that at all but it's still a popular myth that's propagated. 
Absolutely. And, and, you know, most there's been so much propaganda about this that most people believe that that is the case and that this is that, that idea is well established when it's absolutely not and can lead, as you say, to, you know, very harmful treatments being prescribed that really are not not helpful. So as, as you rightly say, most people are presented with antidepressants and told they need to take them because they have an underlying chemical imbalance and the antidepressant can put it right. What we should be saying to people if we are offering drugs like antidepressants, is that here is a drug that will make you feel a bit different. And that may or may not be helpful. It depends on the individual, how they experience the, the alterations produced by the drug, what's going on in their life and what else they need to do. But that it is almost certainly associated with long-term effects that we don't quite understand. I agree. And also, I wanted to ask what function you felt that psychiatric drugs should play in mental health care, because clearly they have a role, and I don't think anyone is advocating banning them entirely. But as it is at the moment, they are the first intervention used in many cases, and that certainly was my experience. I just wondered what you felt their correct place was. Well, I think I think it depends on the drug and it depends on the problem. And we can't make blanket statements about it. So if someone's very psychotic and really, really preoccupied by hallucinations, delusions and other strange experiences going on in their head, a drug that calms them down and maybe dampens their thinking processes down a bit might be useful. And some of what we call the antipsychotic drugs do that. So I, th- I think that antipsychotic drugs can be useful if, for someone who's acutely psychotic and also some general sedatives to help them feel calmer and help them sleep are probably probably may also be useful in some cases but that's a specific situation where someone's acutely psychotic and so psychotic that they're not able to think themselves out of that state if someone's depressed or anxious there may be a role for a short-term sedative but it must be presented very clearly to someone as as a drug that's a sedative and we know that sedatives are addictive and you know difficult to stop and that you build up tolerance to them so that all needs to be presented to people to emphasize how important it is that they should only be used short term something like antidepressants for depression i think is more complicated i think the idea of giving someone a substance that just sort of alters your emotions a bit when you're feeling very low might be appealing when someone's feeling really, really down. It might, the idea that there might be a drug that will take the edge off their feelings might be appealing. But it worries me because in the long term, people probably need to experience those feelings to come to terms with them and to deal with what it was that caused them in the first place. So I think even though in the short term, maybe there's a rationale for using um, antidepressants, which seem to have a sort of slight emotional numbing effect in some cases, might be there. In the long term, it might it might even actually prevent people from from dealing with things that, that need to be dealt with and enabling them to get over their difficulties. That's very true and does apply in my case. And I feel that the adverse effects of my antidepressant have almost prevented me from building up the kind of coping mechanisms that I needed to address the difficulties in my life. Yeah, and I think that's a very common experience. And I think that is one of the main reasons why so many people get stuck on antidepressants for so long. And we've got good data that that's happening, that people are ending up taking them for years and years and years. And, you know, that suggests that either they've tried to come off and it's just been too difficult, maybe due to you know, physiological withdrawal symptoms, or they get frightened to come off because, as you say, they haven't had the opportunity to build up other ways of coping with with the sorts of difficulties that they experience. It is quite easy to get six or 12 months into antidepressant treatment and then start, as you say, to worry about what will happen if you did stop. You think to yourself, if I stop my antidepressant, all I'll be is back where I was when I first needed to take it anyway. And I haven't perhaps made the necessary changes in my life or done things to make myself psychologically stronger or whatever else it took to address the root cause. So the drug is just a sticking plaster, isn't it? Uh, Absolutely. And, and, And one that I think can really reduce people's confidence, because if you come through an episode of depression without using medication or having used it only very briefly, you know that it's what you did that got you over it. But if you're taking the medication, the temptation is, even if you you know, are not convinced it's true, the temptation is to think, well, maybe it was the antidepressant. Maybe I do really need it and can't cope without it. And you, you haven't therefore really got the confidence to stop. And as you say, when that's combined with experiencing 
you know, physical and emotional withdrawal symptoms, that must put people in a terribly, terribly vulnerable situation when they're trying to stop medication. I think it does. And another concern is that if you look at the patient information leaflet that comes with the drugs, it will say, keep taking your antidepressant for at least six months, even after your depressive symptoms have resolved. And that advice in itself can quite easily lead to dependence. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. From my point of view, the people should take the minimum amount of drugs for the shortest amount of time possible. That should be a general principle, I think. Thank you, Dr Moncrief. And I wanted to ask for your views on psychiatric drug withdrawal. I personally, and many people that I've spoken with for this podcast, have found reducing or stopping these medications to be extremely difficult, impossible even for some. Despite this, many doctors remain unaware or unwilling to accept that withdrawal effects are real, or they attempt to explain them away as merely psychological in origin. What can we do to better influence and inform doctors so they're able to support people who are struggling with their psychoactive prescription medications? Uh, yeah, good good question. I, I think we need to get much more information out to doctors, GPs and psychiatrists about the difficulty some people can have with withdrawing from antidepressants and benzodiazepines in particular, but all sorts of, of psychoactive drugs. Because as you say, there really just isn't adequate awareness out there. The other difficulty is getting material published on this. So th- there are one or two case studies But because there's such a prejudice in favour of publishing huge studies and randomised controlled trials, it's very difficult to get this information into the scientific literature. And that really needs to be done. And and case studies of people who've really struggled with withdrawal are really actually very important to present as scientific information. Because this is, you know, we, we, we can't set up a huge, you know, a huge experiment where we put people on this, you know, we put normal people on this these medications for years and then withdraw half of them and leave half of them on that would be the only way of absolutely rigorously testing out what you know what are actual withdrawal symptoms we can't ever do that study and therefore we really need to document people's experience like yours who've had difficulty coming off these medications and as you say it's really not uncommon especially for people who've been taking them for a couple of years or you know years rather than just a few weeks well thank you and what i think would really help me and others like me is to be able to find a conclusive scientific paper that demonstrates that dependence and withdrawal effects are far more common than doctors realise. Doctors' general view seems to be that withdrawal effects are limited to a few very sensitive patients and they generally resolve within a few weeks. But this is very different to the reality that many people experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've come across people who've had to break open capsules and measure out the grains of the drug inside the capsule to try and taper down slowly enough to avoid really, really unbearable withdrawal symptoms. Mm. You know, so so this is not an uncommon experience to to find the physiological process of withdrawal very um, unpleasant and very prolonged as well. It's unbelievably cruel, isn't it? Because if we had an alcoholic and we took away their alcohol overnight, or somebody that's dependent on nicotine and took away their cigarettes, we would expect them to be in a very difficult physical and emotional place. And yet... We don't seem to believe the same can be true of quite powerful psychoactive prescription medications. Crucially important to understand that we, we as a society, doctors, are prescribing medications that change the brain. Um, you know, change the way that it functions, change brain chemicals, change receptors, change it in all sorts of ways that we don't fully understand at all yet, mm. and um, th- that therefore have these unpredictable consequences in the long term, like causing these protracted withdrawal uh, symptoms. A withdrawal symptom is a symptom that's caused because an adaptation that the brain or the body has made is no longer compensated for by the presence of the drug. Now, that adaptation that's been stimulated by taking the drug may may never go away it it may never reverse we just don't know um what we do know is that drugs change the brain you know that's been demonstrated very clearly in animal experiments and with, with lots of data from humans and we know also if you look at the addiction field that that people who come off long term benzodiazepines or opiates um, or other drugs, you know, we're we're not we're not quite sure yet whether their brains ever get back to normal after 
you know, being on mind altering substances for a long time. So I think overall, people's experience seems to suggest that in the end, they get back to normal. Yeah. But it may be, you know, a much longer process than we've previously thought it to be. So there is that understanding, but it, it, the rationale is not clearly stated anywhere. The evidence that, that's been used to to build up those, to, to justify those practices is, is difficult to track down. So we really need, you know, some more clear directives about how to help people to withdraw from a whole variety of psychoactive substances, including antidepressants, which are so widely used. But even if the proportion of people that has difficulty with them, with coming off them is quite small, that's still going to be a huge, huge number of people because they are being, you know, so liberally prescribed. That's true. And given that just in the UK, we prescribed 63 million antidepressants alone in a single year, costing the NHS £780,000 per day. Even from a purely economic viewpoint, there's money to be saved for the NHS by reducing repeat prescriptions for these things. And then there's also the difficult to quantify costs of people like me staying on antidepressant or antipsychotic drugs for 20 or 30 years. Then the longer term effects on our health are going to need more time from the health services, aren't they? Absolutely, absolutely. And if if you're struggling with, um, you know, difficult withdrawal symptoms as you, as you try and come off, that's also going to affect your effectiveness and productivity and, you know, have all sorts of economic consequences in that way too. You're right. And the other thing that struck me is almost exclusively my recent interactions with my doctors have been about the medications rather than my original presenting condition. They're not talking to me about my health and well-being. They tend to be, should we increase your dosage? Should we add another drug to the mix? Should we swap you to something else? The discussion almost centres now around the medication. It becomes a treadmill, I think, doesn't it? You know, you start on one drug and that probably doesn't solve the original problem. So you've still got the original problem and it may give you some further problems. So that so one reaction to that, which seems to be quite common, is to then prescribe another drug um, or, or to change the drug. To, to try and address those problems. And then you, you know, get into this whole spiral where you, where you end up being tried on, you know, more and more different sorts of substances with all the problems that that entails. Well, I certainly see a lot of evidence of that. And one of my hopes with the podcast is that we can capture those user experiences and share them with GPs and psychiatrists, because I personally have found withdrawal to be quite an isolating and lonely experience. And because of that, I've hidden myself away and and not challenged my doctors on it because I'm not taken seriously. I believe this creates a hidden problem and that doctors don't generally know how their patients are dealing with these medications because their patients are not telling them. Uh, Absolutely. And, um, you know, I I think that is reflected on the numbers in the numbers of people that are just end up stuck on these medications for years. I'm sure that a lot of those people would probably like to try and come off them. But it, it's too difficult to negotiate that with their doctors. And, you know, the the withdrawal effects are are too difficult to tolerate without, um, you know, really good support from from the professionals. I was going to say the, um, the British Medical Association and various other bodies have suggested to NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, that produce these guidelines um, for doctors about different areas of treatment, that they should produce a guideline for withdrawing from psychoactive medications. And hopefully that, if a guideline that, like that was produced, it would include up-to-date advice on the best way to titrate down from different sorts of substances. So I think that could be really useful for people and, and also actually just a useful way of highlighting the lack of evidence in many places and the concerns we should have about long-term treatment because of that. I think that would go a long way to helping people because... It must be difficult for doctors now because they know the patient in front of them can go on the internet as soon as they get home and they can expose themselves to a range of very good or very poor quality information on their condition. But in this regard, the patient being treated is the expert and doctors should be listening to patients' experiences of withdrawal. In my experience, I've had doctors tell me that withdrawal was nothing more than a recurrence of my depression or anxiety when the issues I was experiencing were very different to when I initially needed help. I think, sadly, sometimes it's easier to blame the patient for the problems than to acknowledge that our treatments are highly problematic. I think some doctors do feel a bit defensive about, you know, what they're prescribing. And 
yeah have a, have a tendency therefore to say it's it's your fault it's your problem it's nothing to do with with the medicine and I, you know i think that's that's really sad if there was greater awareness that these medications can be so difficult to get off hopefully that sort of tendency would be more uncommon well i'm really grateful dr moncrief that you and others are willing to be so open minded about this and to try and change others attitudes and to question whether our drug centered model of care is the right one for emotional or psychological distress I'm really pleased that more work is being done. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's good that it's been picked up in the media as well. I think, you know, several newspapers and, and the BBC and television channels have started to question it as well, which is really good. That's true. And the more we can gather user experiences together to show that this is actually a more widespread issue, the better. I'd like to go on now and ask about the radar study, if that's OK. The radar study, I believe, focuses on antipsychotic drugs and the effects of long term treatment. Could you tell us about the study, your involvement with it, and the desired outcome of the study? So, RADAR stands for Research into Antipsychotic Discontinuation and Reduction, and it's funded by the Government Research Department, that's the National Institute of Health Research. So, I'm really excited because the, the fact that it's been funded indicates that there is some willingness on, on the part of uh, the government research department, which is, you know, staffed by very high level medical researchers to investigate the consequences of trying to take people off medication or trying to get people's doses down in a substantial way. Mm. So the, what the radar study will principally involve, and we've just started this part of it, is a randomized trial where we're going to compare people who stay on their antipsychotic medication with people who have a gradual and supported reduction of that medication. We're doing this study in people who have had psychotic episodes or who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or or a similar diagnosis to that. And the reason that it's being funded and, and that it is being supported both by the government research department, but also by several prominent leading psychiatrists who've done research on um, drug treatment before, is because there are more and more concerns that the use of long-term antipsychotics can be harmful to the brain and that it may not have all the benefits that it's generally been thought to have. And that's partly because the previous long-term studies have usually involved taking people who've been on the medication for a long time and then taking them off, taking some of them off that medication and putting them onto a placebo more or less overnight. And as you know, and as we've been talking about, if you take someone off a drug that's been, you know, working on their brain for years and years and years and changing their brain's makeup for years, then that will have significant consequences for how they feel and behave. And it seems there seems to be evidence that it may that that shock to the system may even precipitate a psychotic episode. So if you take long-term treatment and then stop it, especially suddenly, it seems that you may be more at risk of having a relapse of your condition than you would have been if you hadn't got on to the long-term treatment in the first place. The other concern is because of the nature of antipsychotic drugs, because what they seem to do is dampen down mental processes and slow up people's thinking and movement. There's some evidence that they reduce people's functioning, that they actually make it more difficult for people to go about their everyday lives, to go to work or get involved in other social activities. And there's some some evidence that that's the case, and, and that would follow logically from what we know about the acute effects of these drugs. So the RADAR study is set up to see whether we can gradually take people off this medication or get people down to much lower doses and to see whether we can do that without people having lots of serious relapses and to see whether in the long term that will help people improve people's level of functioning. Thank you. That's really interesting. And can you tell me how many people will be involved in the study? So the target number that we've got to involve is just over 400 and we just started. So I think we've enrolled about five or six people so far, Um, but uh, hopefully we'll have higher numbers by the end of this year. We've got uh, just over two two to three years to recruit people into the study. So it's going to be a big study. It's it's going to take place across many different centres 
and, and going to involve you know a lot of effort and cooperation from different mental health services and particularly from consultant psychiatrists. So I am relying on to get the study done, relying on consultant psychiatrists to volunteer to do the study and to help the patients that are randomized into the antipsychotic discontinuation group to reduce their medication slowly and safely with support and monitoring. Well, it's a very exciting piece of work because not only are you getting important data on the long-term effects of antipsychotic medications, but you're also getting direct input and experience of helping patients safely and gradually withdraw from their medication. Yeah, absolutely, which uh, with antipsychotics like antidepressants, there's very little guidance about how to help people come off, partly because it's just been assumed that everyone should just stay on them forever. So no, no one's really thought about it in much detail. So I'm hoping that, uh, that that's one really tangible, helpful thing that can come out of this study is guidance about how best to help people reduce and and what the pros and cons of that process are. And Dr Moncrief, do you think that general lessons learned from the study could also apply to antidepressants or do you think the mechanisms of action are so different that the knowledge wouldn't be applicable? Well, uh, the, the fact that the radar study has been funded, I think, shows there's a greater willingness um, among doctors and psychiatrists to think that actually we need to have some alternatives to just sticking people on medication for years and years. And we really need to put some effort into helping people to come off. So I help, hope that from that respect, the radar study will, will um, provide lessons and, and more, I suppose, it provide encouragement um, for doctors to think about helping people to come off antidepressants and other classes of psychiatric medication. Um, but I think that probably how you do antidepressant withdrawal, the nuts and bolts of it will be slightly different from antipsychotic withdrawal. And it, it will be different for different antipsychotics and different for different antidepressants as well, depending on things like their half-life, that is how quickly they act and how quickly they're excreted from the body um, and, and other aspects of their effects. So I think withdrawal always has to be individualised, both to the person who's withdrawing, but also to the drug they're trying to come off, so that there are some general lessons that, that we can learn. Thank you, that's great. This is a pivotally important piece of work because we do need to fill a gaping hole in knowledge and experience. And this work will inform guidance that doctors can look to when they are presented with people who are struggling with antidepressant or antipsychotic withdrawal. Yeah, and, and just to say as well, there are many people who've been stuck on antipsychotic medication for years who would like an opportunity to try and come off their medication, whatever the, the results or consequences. And, you know, I, I feel passionately that they should be given that option, that they should be supported in that. So hopefully this study will enable more people to go down that route if that's what they want. I think that does show that there's, you know, a greater awareness that uh, we're using far too many drugs and we need to provide more help for people to get off. Dr Moncrief, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. It was such an interesting discussion and thank you too for all of your valuable work in this area. Feedback. Feedback. I'd love to hear from you, so please get in touch. You can email me on feedback at jfmore.co.uk. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for listening and for your feedback too. The podcast recently achieved over 10,000 downloads within its first eight weeks, which is incredible. I'm so grateful for your support and encouragement too. And also, I'm keen for as many as possible to discover the podcast in iTunes, and you can really help that by leaving a review and a star rating. If you're listening in iTunes now, please leave us a review. It takes just a couple of minutes, but it makes a big difference. Thank you. Also, having interviewed Dr. Moncrief today, I wanted to let you know that she's written an excellent piece for Madden America entitled Inconvenient Truths About Antipsychotics, which is a response to a recent study that claimed that the benefits of antipsychotic drugs outweigh their risks. It's an excellent piece and well worth your time. To read it, visit the website madinamerica.com or I'll put a link in the podcast show notes too. I also wanted to mention this event on Saturday the 20th of May between 11am and 3pm local time at Hardys Bay Community Church, Hardys Bay, New South Wales, Australia. There is a showing of Kevin P. Miller's film Generation RX as part of an event for emerging 
Emerging Proud. Emerging Proud is a campaign about providing hope to people undergoing severe psychological distress or a spiritual crisis, and there are launch events taking place on the 12th of May. For more information, you can visit the website emergingproud.com. For details on the 20th of May event, you can search in Facebook for Emerging Proud and Generation RX Film Event. Finally, if you're struggling with withdrawal yourself and don't know where to turn, there are some excellent resources listed on my website, jfmore.co.uk. Please go and have a look. Please do not increase, decrease or stop your psychoactive prescription medication without the advice and support of a medical or mental health professional. Thank you so much for listening today and until next time, take care. Thank you so much for listening to Let's Talk Withdrawal. Come back next week for more news and views. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review and subscribe in iTunes.